We're continuing our message series on the Sermon on the Mount, the life that Jesus calls you to live. We're in message number eight, so that's the second message in your study guide booklets that you have this morning if you're following along and taking notes and enjoying all the little extras that we've put in there for you. Violence and conflict have been part of the human experience ever since Adam and Eve first sinned in the Garden of Eden. And historically, societies have attempted to deal with violence and conflict by passing laws through the rule of law. Judges preside over courtrooms in order to deal with the chaos that we find in our world. And there's even a phrase that comes out of the courtroom that we're probably all familiar with. We usually hear this phrase whenever misbehavior and, and disorder comes about in the courtroom. The judge will take, pick up his gavel and he'll start hitting it on his bench and he'll say, order in the court, order in the court. Sometimes when feathers get ruffled and people are really out of control, he'll have to say order in the court more than once. But think about that for a moment. Can any amount of shushing or gavel banging by a judge overcome the, the chaos and the hate and the vengeance that is so often bound up in the human heart. Rules and courtrooms do not take that out of there. You probably are already aware, if you know me, that when I go home for lunch during the week, I like to eat my lunch and, and watch those reality TV programs with, with the court shows. Are you familiar with those? You know, there's Judge Judy and Hot Bench and uh, People's Court, Judge Mathis. I mean, I, I, I enjoy watching those shows. I don't know, maybe you think I'm weird, but it's kind of funny sometimes to see the plaintiff and defendant go at it against one another. And you know, when they're in the courtroom, they're not even supposed to be addressing each other. They're only supposed to be addressing the court, which is the judge. But so often you'll see them, they'll face one another and they'll start saying, you're lying and calling each other names and yelling at one another. And then the judge has to say, order in the court. And you'd think that these guys would know that that is not a good thing to do because how many times do you see it over and over on these programs? The judge, if they don't get their acts together and zip up their mouths, will, will kick them out of court and dismiss their case. Now, most of the time the judge is able to get them quieted down but it's always kind of interesting because as the, as the plaintiff and defendant are walking out of the courtroom after their case, there's always a guy there to interview them. And usually the people, they're not happy, right? They just went through this experience and it wasn't good for them maybe. And the interviewer always asks some questions that's kind of poking, their, poking at them, pushing their buttons and it makes them even worse. And, and I, I always laugh at that stuff, but <coughs> Here's one thing I've observed as I've watched these court shows over the years. The judge can sometimes make people be civil in his courtroom, but he cannot quiet the chaos and the turmoil and the violence and the bitterness that's bound up in people's hearts. That is something that God has to get involved with. And really, what's at the crux of violence in our culture and world today is it's all about the heart. And no amount of court time, no number of, of laws is going to reduce the violence that's prevalent today in our culture, in our, in our world, if people's hearts continue to be full of hatred and vengeance. Well, today's message isn't intended to be a commentary on our judicial branch effectiveness, but I'm mentioning this because it, it ties in with what Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount regarding a person's heart and how it influences our thoughts and our actions. Because you see, judges and prosecutors, they can convict people all they want. Send them to jail. Execute them if you wish. And yet, the trend of violence and conflict continues to go up in our country. Why is that? Well, maybe it's that there's something bound up in the human heart that no law or court can remove. I'm just saying that the courts are limited in what they can do. I'm not saying we should get rid of courts. They serve a purpose, but they are limited in what they can do. And it's important for us to realize that when the Founding Fathers developed the principles upon which our nation was built, 
They realized that American democracy would only work if its citizens contained two things, morality and godly faith. And today what you see going on is people are relying on the courts to decide everything for them because everyone demands that their own ideas of right and wrong be recognized. And that's creating a problem in America. The courts were never intended to decide every little issue of right and wrong. And so Jesus, he comes along 2,000 years ago and he offers us another way for addressing the chaos and the violence that's in our heart. Because remember, this is a heart thing. And Jesus knew that if we are going to be able to get along, then our attitudes and our thinking and our actions, they must all be informed by God and his word. And so he offers us a way of non-retaliation and love for enemies. Rather than getting even and obsessing about revenge, whether you go to court or not. Now stop and think about that for a moment. What would happen in our personal relationships if we accepted Jesus' way instead of trying to get even all the time? What would happen if instead of only loving those who loved us, we accepted his ethic of universal love even for enemies, even for people of a different ethnic group, even for people of a different political party. You see, this is a standard that's hard for us to accept, even when we're playing around. Let me just give you an illustration. We're coming to the end of the Christian camp season here in August, um, and I was involved with that up at Rock Lake Christian Assembly, our church camp, for about 12 or 15 years. And uh, right about this time, I and a number of people from this congregation actually would go up to Rock Lake Christian Assembly in Vestiburg, and we would work the week of fourth and fifth grade camp. At that time, there would be anywhere from 75 to 105 fourth and fifth grade campers that we would be in charge of from Sunday afternoon till Friday evening. And it was a blast. But I remember when I was the dean of those weeks of camp, I would say to the faculty who were volunteering their time with me, I would always say at the beginning of the week, <clears throat> when we were kind of in that training process, I was given that last hurrah before we got started, I would say, <clears throat> make sure that you are extra strict regarding your expectations and rules on the kids these first couple of days. Because you can always relax your rules and expectations later on if you want to, but it's nearly impossible to go from lax to more strict if things start getting out of control. You know what I'm saying? The kids just won't respect you. You'll have discipline problems all week long and it won't be fun. <laughs> this is especially true when it comes to pranks, right? Pranking, I'm telling you what, for fourth and fifth graders in camp, you think, ah, oh, what's the big deal about that? It is a big deal. And if you've ever worked with kids, whether it's at camp or in another context, you know you got to nip that stuff in the bud because kids can be very revengeful, especially when it comes to getting even. And the scenario, it always goes like this. One camper decides he's going to prank another camper, and then that camper decides he's going to get even with them, only he doesn't just get even, he has to one-up it, right? And so the pranking gets worse and worse, and you know that's how it works when it comes to revenge and getting even and getting back at someone. Revenge usually escalates. And if it's pranking, and if this pranking and revenge doesn't involve something disgusting in the beginning, it very quickly gets to that point. It could be visually disgusting, but it's almost certainly going to involve some kind of smell. The most gross, disgusting smells that you could ever imagine, and you don't like it. And once you've done something to someone, they just up the ante and they make things worse. What starts out as somebody else's underwear on a kid's pillow, it ends up as atomic bombs blowing up on the hillside. I'm telling you, I've worked the week of fourth and fifth grade camp. That's how revenge works. And so Jesus says, as we read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, in fact, open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, the first book in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, you have heard that it was said, 
eye for eye and tooth for tooth. This sounds so vicious, doesn't it? It, it sounds like you're being mean or something. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But really, this Old Testament law actually placed limits on the vengeance that a person could take against someone else. Because before then, they didn't care. You just, you were mad, your emotions were high, and you just did whatever you felt like at the moment. And so often, you know, people were being killed for the slightest little offense. But the principle of eye for eye and tooth for tooth, it means that you can only respond in kind, thereby keeping that vengeance from escalating, right? No atomic bombs going off on the hillside. But then Jesus does something totally unexpected. He takes this principle and he goes entirely to a different place with it. When it comes to choosing to do nice to one another, Jesus offers us some solutions to this vengeance issue in our life. Like for one thing, in your personal relationships, refuse to get even. He says in essence, not only do I not want you to over respond, I don't even want you to take vengeance at all. And in Matthew chapter five, verse 39, Jesus says, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Then Jesus gives us a second solution to doing nice to one another. When he says in essence, don't just not get even, counter with positive responses. And he gives us this series of remarkable examples in verses 39 through 42. He says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, you go with him too. <laughs> Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You know, this is probably about the time where we're starting to go to ourselves, Lord, have you lost your mind? Does this stuff really work? How, how can we make this work? There almost seems to be something humorous about this as we think about it. So, you strike me on the right cheek. Now, we're, just so you know, we're, we're talking about the blows of insult here. We're not talking about physical altercations. So you strike me on the right cheek and I'm going to turn to you my left cheek as well. What does that mean? Is Jesus asking us to invite another blow? And the answer is yes. So if you insult me, my proper response is to be almost a playful. Is that all you got? Print it on. It sounds like Jesus has given us a kind of holy way to be a little bit lovingly sarcastic here. And he's kind of saying to us, this is how I want you to respond when people insult you. Is this the best you've got? Surely, you know who I am, you can do better than that. Or if a Roman soldier comes around and he the Roman soldiers back then, by the way, by law, had the power to make you carry their equipment for one mile. Their equipment was pretty heavy. If a Roman soldier comes around and says, I want you to take my equipment and walk for one mile with me, as a Jewish person in, in Roman-occupied territory, <clears throat> you would do that. And at the end of one mile, you would drop their stuff because you fulfilled the obligation of the Roman law at that point. But Jesus says, at that point, I want you to turn to that soldier and I want you to say, you know what, it's only been a mile. I'm feeling strong, I'm enjoying my walk with you. May I walk with you for another mile? Or if someone sues you and takes away your coat, say something like the following, well, as long as you've taken my stuff, why don't you just take all of my clothes? Now, of course, at some point, that gets a little bit embarrassing, right? But Seriously, it's as if Jesus is offering us up a holy solution to counter violence and aggression, and it's almost comical. I like the story that Bob Russell shared in the Lookout Magazine article. We give away the Lookout Magazine here, and, uh, and he was a minister of a, a very large church down in Louisville, Kentucky, but he shared in this article about the time when he responded positively rather than negatively to man's complaint about how his church was addressing their church doing mission trips right after 9-11 happened back in 2001. He and the elders in their church, they decided after that happened to suspend short-term mission trips for three months rather than send inexperienced travelers into harm's way. 
and they had prayed extensively about it. They had discussed this thoroughly, and they put a lot of thought into it. But when their decision was explained in the church newsletter, a believer from another church, another church, mind you, wrote these words. He said, I'm appalled that you would knuckle under so easily to Satan's attempt to block the spread of the gospel. In case you haven't cracked your Bible in a while, your devotion to God is supposed to take precedent over everything else. What could you be possibly afraid of? Getting to heaven too soon? <laughs> After a bunch of other mean-spirited criticism? He ends with this. It's incomprehensible that God could have led you down such a cowardly path, so I must assume that you didn't consult him at all in this decision. Wow. As I'm reading that, I'm wanting to explode atomic bombs on the hillside. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm starting to think back how I might respond to that. Probably wouldn't have been kind in my younger days. But I love how Bob Russell responded. He simply said, from your letter, I'm picking up that you don't agree with our decision. <laughs> and he left it at that. <laughs> we are so often quick to dismiss Jesus' way, aren't we? But I just want to point out that, you know, if you want to do nice to someone and follow Jesus' principles here, you need to know this. Uh, we need to counter with positive responses and not negativity and complaining. And that's when we follow through with what Jesus said. We stop vengeance in its tracks with our winsomeness, maybe with some humor, that says, if you want to get after me, you got to do a lot better than that. But that brings us to a third solution to our vengeance issue that Jesus points out, and that is, if you want to do nice to someone, you don't get ahead by responding with violence or insult. And we just need to know that. Nobody gets ahead in, 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 in either in life or in this world, and it will always fall apart if we are just going to respond out of vengeance to one another. And so Jesus says, in verses 43 through 45, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, there isn't an Old Testament verse that says you should love only your own countrymen, that you should only love your own neighbor or your own friends or family and hate your enemies per se. That's not in the Old Testament. In fact, Jesus is not saying that that's what the Old Testament teaches, that you hate your enemies. But that's somehow, through the years, how people started living out that command and how they, how they started interpreting the law. They started interpreting it as love those who love you, hate those who hate you. But then Jesus comes along and he addresses this issue and he shares this amazing insight, giving us another solution to addressing this problem of bitterness and vengeance in our life. He says, when you love like that, you're only loving those who love you and hating your enemies. That makes you exactly like every other pagan in the world. Okay? Because everybody loves their own kind, right? Everybody loves people who respond to them in helpful and friendly ways. Everybody loves the members of their own tribe, so to speak. Their own circle of friends and acquaintances. But the thing that sets Christians apart in this area, says Jesus, so we love people who aren't a part of our family, who aren't one of our circle of friends, who aren't one of our best buds. We love people who treat us badly, maybe even treat us violently. What sets Christians apart is whom they choose to love. We love our enemies. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verses 46 through 48, Jesus says, if you love those who loved you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow, this is some heavy stuff. And the question is, does Jesus really mean that? Is it really possible to say, I'm going to respond to my enemies, not with violence, not with anger, not with hatred but with redeeming love and i think jesus does mean what he said too, that if you're like me you probably don't have a lot of hardcore enemies 
or maybe if you do have some, you probably don't have that many. Probably for most of us, we don't do the sort of things that, that make you the target of people and, and thus form real enemies in your life. Even though we may be challenged to love people who are outside of our circle of friends, we probably aren't faced with somebody who is a true enemy and then having to love them. For you and me, I think what we need to think of it is like this. Your biggest challenge in life isn't loving your enemies, it's loving the irritating people who encounter you day in and day out, right? You know what I'm saying? If you're like me, I don't have a ton of enemies, but I have a lot of irritants. <laughs> and the primary definition of irritants is that irritants don't know how irritating they really are, right? And you probably know someone like that. You probably have them in mind right now. Just don't start laughing and poke the person next to you. That could get you in trouble. I heard about a minister who was finishing up a, a message series on marriage one day. And at the end of the service, he was passing out small wooden crosses to each married couple who was present. And he said, what I want you to do is place this cross in the middle of the room in which you fight the most and be reminded of God's command to love one another. That way, you won't argue so much. One woman came up to him after the service and said, you'd better give me five. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what I want us to learn from Jesus when it comes to the irritating people in your life. You don't just love the people who love you back. You even love the people who are incapable of loving you back, who are incapable of being true friends, whether they're your enemy or an irritation. Jesus says, when you love those who can't return your love, that's when you start to change the world. And that's an awesome thing. As I think about Jesus' words regarding violence and loving enemies, I kind of picture in my mind two cowboys, and they're standing at one another, and their guns are drawn, and they're pointing their guns one at the other. And they're, each one is afraid to lower their weapon for fear that the other one will kill them. Now switch out the people and the places and exchange the guns for fists or words or bitter attitudes. And this has been the experience of people worldwide since Adam and Eve sinned back in the Garden of Eden. We believe the only way to protect ourselves from violence is to be violent in return. The only way to protect ourselves from our enemies is to have more power than they have, to have one up on them. And that's led our lives and our churches and our families and our neighborhoods and our work environments and our politics and our nations to the brink of disaster and failure. And so we have this escalating thing of words and power and violence and it hasn't really protected us. It's just made life worse. So Jesus comes along. He shares with us another way. He says that when a person does something against you, don't retaliate, but love your enemies rather than make war against them. And of all the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps this one is the most difficult to believe and to practice. We just don't believe that creative nonviolence and love will overcome the powers of darkness and the troubles in our life and world. We're too easily offended we become too easily defensive. How can we expect things to ever change in the world or in our culture if we don't begin practicing this kind of peacemaking in our own lives? We're too quick to retaliate. We're too quick to love only those who are within our circle of friends, who those within our family, those within our neighborhood. And we see everyone else as a threat. Well, until this love of enemies becomes the way of our personal lives, guess what? Our culture will never become more peace-loving and nonviolent. And to be a follower of Jesus Christ means that we love what he loves and we hate what he hates. And it should be clear to us that what he hates is violence and conflict and hatred in the world, but what he loves are all the people around all of that on all sides of it. He says, Jesus says, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust, right? He loves people. Now this may be as big a challenge as anywhere in all the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to putting it into practice in our life. 
So when it comes to your personal squabbles, when it comes to those people who slight you and those people who irritate you and offend you, to those people who step on your rights but they demand that their rights be recognized, will you be the one who says, I'm tired of the violence, I'm tired of the retaliation, I'm tired of the hatred, I'm tired of always trying to one-up the other guy. Will you be Jesus' disciple, his follower, and say, I want to try Jesus' way, and I will even love my enemies. Jesus did that for you and me, didn't he? The Bible tells us, while you were yet a sinner, while I was yet a sinner, while we were yet his enemy, Christ died for you. He loved you even when you were unlovable. So why wouldn't you do the same for others like that in your life? Let's do it. Let's choose to do nice, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for our Lord and his challenging words in Matthew chapter 5. It's easy for us to acknowledge the message. It's not so easy to put it into practice, especially when we feel affronted and offended and irritated. But Lord, we hear your message for us today, and we know what you're calling us to do. Help us to remember to do that, to do nice to one another. Therefore, to help your cause be promoted in this world. Thank you for your love for your forgiveness, for your kindness to us, even when we didn't deserve it. It's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. All God's people said, Amen.